Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. And you're very welcome along this Friday afternoon to Friday Night Racing. Myself and Johnny with you every Friday afternoon on all of OTB's social channels. You can get us on Facebook, Twitter and, of course, on the OTB Sports app. But, of course, then every Friday evening we're also on Off The Ball on News Talk. Uh, as we have been for a good couple of years now talking about this and bringing you some of the best uh, stories in racing. Uh, a reminder, of course, Friday Night Racing is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie and you can follow the Twitter account at HRI Racing. The hashtag is every racing moment. Johnny, do you think we're going to get to be in person racing anytime soon? We might get a couple of thousand going racing by the end of June, start of July. Is that ridiculous? No, I don't think so. Um you know, I, I guess what's most worrying at the moment is just the, the talk of what's going on in India and the Indian strain and all that. And it, 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 it's COVID has been a case of almost when you think you're you're nearly there, something kind of sets you back. So I've been kind of loath to make any predictions about what might happen. But I think um, you, we can see now in Northern Ireland that, you know, they've, they've a, a, a plan for games to resume in sport there in, in the very near future. And I don't think we'd be that far behind. I also think um, sport needs to be quite loud in terms of you know, imploring to government that, um, you know, s some some level of support isn't a bad thing. You know, I've been going to League of Ireland games and it's getting very, very tedious, to be honest. It's like it's, it comes to a situation now where you're, where you're down to go to a game and you're kind of nearly hoping you're not going. And, like, I'm not, um, I'm not, not energised about going to Punchstown next week because it's nothing without people. So I think race, co race courses haven't really been vocal enough, to my mind, about getting people back, particularly owners who've had basically a year now of paying bills without being able to see their horse run. OK, so hopefully that uh, I, I think that that din will start to become more evident. I think that everybody was very cautious about being seen to be lobbying publicly. But now that the graduated reopening is a topic of conversation, you can start being a bit louder and it makes more sense and no one's going to tut tut at you. Exactly. Yeah. And um, I, I, you know, I was talking to a few uh, people in the League of Ireland this week and they're very, very anxious to get back. And I think there was a survey in um, the UK where 97% of supporters, I don't know if it was a football sports or sporting fans, want to go uh, to sport again. And um, I think, for particularly for the elderly person who, who really, if say the, the old man who enjoyed going to his football game or enjoyed going to his rugby game as a, as a big point of his weekend or every second weekend, um, for him not to be able to do that for a year, um, so I, I, like I, I know at Galway United, this is going back like to last year, they were looking at how do we have a particular part of the stadium that is extra safe for elderly people who want to go to games, whether they're vaccinated or not. Um, and I have a lot of sympathy for them because they, you know, th that what can be a huge focal point of your life as you get older is taken away from you. And. Uh, you know, I know it's it's glib to say sport without fans is nothing, but like it's, football wouldn't last very long. I think in its current format, it, it's just getting very tedious. Uh, one of the other things that happened during the week, of course, the um, HRI released uh, the details of a survey. Thirty nine percent of the population have an interest in horse racing versus twenty three percent in twenty twenty. That's sixteen percent surge. It's absolutely huge, right? And hopefully, it translates into bums on seats and and uh, increased atmosphere at the racetracks. When when this all started, we did say there was an opportunity for racing as one of those sports that was going to continue to be there to have some crossover to to reach beyond the uh, diehard racing community you'd have to say they've done a pretty good job of that they have ra racing has um i hope racing will come out of the pandemic in reasonable shape i mean it, it's even remarkable to see tg car and um, you know like for example last sunday was was uh, based in tremor and uh was shown Dundalk as well, and it came across really well to you know a terrestrial audience who, if you happen to be um, flicking onto TG Cahar, and uh, I think you know the the figures for the Grand National recently, the uh, English Grand National were were really really encouraging, and um, you know we were all in a situation prior to Cheltenham where we we're trying to defend the sport and maybe slightly alarmed about um, you know the PR for the sport, but it's actually come through Cheltenham in a great place, and I know we have Maxine you know, O'Sullivan on today, but I think Rachel Blackmore has no idea of how uh, important she's been for the PR of racing and for showing it in a good light. And, um, you know, it's funny how the world works. You went to, race went into Cheltenham feeling deeply insecure and has come out like looking a million dollars, really. Yeah, well, you mentioned Maxine O'Sullivan as our guest today. I'm delighted to say Maxine is with us. Good afternoon to you, Maxine. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me, lads. You're in Cork. You've got a runner at five o'clock, is that right? Yeah, yeah, here in Cork. So um, they very kindly let me use their office. So uh, delighted. What are your chances today? 
Uh, hopefully, hopefully we have a chance. She's a nice little filly, yeah. Hopefully. And what's her well, name, just in case anybody's is watching live now? Harmonisation. She's great, so you can't miss her. Okay, harmonisation at five o'clock in in Cork this afternoon. It, it, I presume that's your local track. My knowledge of where Lombardstown in County Cork is versus the racetrack versus some potential other tracks. Is that your closest track? Yeah, very close. We're just five minutes over the road, so it's it's very handy. Yeah, yeah. And te- tell us a little bit about Lombardstown because I'm reliably informed it is point to point country. It is, yeah. We're also very close to Drumahan point to point track. So um, we've uh, there's a lot of point to points on there in normal years. So um, galloping and schooling there as well. So we're very lucky to be to be well located between Mallow and Drumahan. So uh, it's a great track, Drumahan, for produce so many good point to pointers. And uh, yeah, it's our local. And presumably, if if somewhere is known as point to point territory, it's not just you guys who are producing horses. There's loads of other point to pointers in the area. That's that's kind of what happens, isn't it? Yeah, there's there's uh, plenty of other point to point trainers mainly around us, and um, I suppose the point to pointing uh, up until a couple of years ago, Cork Waterford area was the the real depth of point to pointing. So um, it was the heart of it. Obviously, Wexford has caught up with us now, and they're um, they're a, a lot more competitive. But um, Drumahan would have been one of the best best point to point tracks. You'd be going there to find your your good four or five year old. So uh, it, it's a great track, and um, it, it's it's around a long time, and uh, yeah, it still produces a lot of good horses. How how have you seen the change, actually, Maxine, in your time? Um, you know, since you were a young girl going to point to points, whatever, with your dad, in terms of the professionalism and, you know, a situation now where the the four year old who wins his maiden like is of, is often far more valuable than a horse that wins a bumper. Um, have you seen a transformation in in the last 10, 15 years? Yeah, massive change. Um, I feel like point to pointing w- was changing anyway, but um, the, the pandemic hasn't been very kind to it. In, in it's like natural her- it, it's real, it's real heritage of racing, if you know what I mean. It's it's the grassroots of racing, and uh, like I remember going point to pointing as a kid. I used to go with my granny and granddad when my uncle William was riding for dad, and. Um, like it was just so different. It was such a day out for the family. The crowds were massive. There would have been like bouncing castles and activities. Um, you, you'd always like you'd always stop off at the pub on the way home. Like I'm not saying it was a massive session, but you'd go to watch the video, and that's how long ago it was. It was a video of um, of the day's races, and and all the owners would would go to that pub. Like I'd say, I could tell you every pub. In, in the Cork Waterford area um, from from stopping on the way home and uh, watching the video uh, back long ago as well there used to be like a race dance it was before my time now but after every point to point the area would have like a, a, a do that night let's say so um, point to pointing like take out the, the commercial side of it has, has changed so much um, in, in recent years and I, I just hope that the, the pandemic won't won't add to that you know um it was just such a great day out for family the crowds were massive the committees used to put in so much effort tea and cakes and it was just so, they were always such a great day um so you know hopefully they, they could come back stronger maybe it'll give everyone a love for it again and uh that, that would be great if that would happen what, so pre-pandemic had it drifted away a little bit from the family environment had it become a bit more serious or, or was that still all happening as well I think it ha- it has got so much more commercial that we'll say your you know your six year old maidens and seven year old maidens and winners of two winners of one horses which were like some owners just love to have a point to pointer and they want to run it like every weekend and it might not, it might be a maiden for the whole year but it's they just love point to pointing love going racing with the family day out um, they can come to the lorry. The minute you arrive, we'd have the owners, they'd meet us at the lorry to be with the horse. You know, it's a, it's a different experience, really, to the race course. And uh, it, it's completely different. And um, I think it has it has gone so commercial, which is great. It needs, to, it, it's it's brilliant. But the actual grassroots of point pointing, which was a really, really fun and enjoyable experience, has, has drifted a little bit.
That, that's very interesting you say that because I suppose it's, um, you know, the, 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 the concept of the point-to-point -point as being that grassroots thing, literally the local farmer's field turned into a racetrack for the day. And I, the first point-to-point -point I went to was Killa, um, obviously in County Cork as well. And um, I think there were 18 bookmakers there that day. Um, no bet fair, no betting exchanges. It was like a throwback to another era. Um, if you bought a cup of soup, it was raising money for the local camogie club. Um, there was a brilliant atmosphere there. Like I, I really couldn't get over it. And it was like, it kind of reminded me of our local, back in the days in, in Kline and in County Galway, the local um, sports day, which would take place once a year. Everyone from the community played some sort of a role. And as much as, um, you know, it's great that you can, you know, the trainer or the owner can make a, a good bit of money if, if his four-year-old wins. It would be sad, Maxine, I think, if it did lose that, um, that it really, in the earth of the Irish people in, in, in rural Ireland, the point-to-point -point ethos. I think so, too. And like you said, the community, like the committees years ago would have actually made money from point-to-points, whereas now I think they're, they're struggling to, to even to hold them because the we'll say the, the public maybe and the there aren't as many people coming for a fun day out. It's more just the racing people who are going to, to run their horse. Hopefully it wins and sell it. Do you know, that's the way I feel it's gone a bit anyway. I, look, I think that this week, because of what's happened with the European Super League, has made everybody just for a moment, and it always wears off because anytime there's a big shock, everybody goes back to normal pretty quickly after it. But everybody is just reevaluating their own relationship with sport and what sport they invest their spare time in, invest their spare money in. So I, I, like, it'd be great if they were to come back sooner rather than later, maybe by the end of the year, some smaller point to points were to start coming back. And those committees, you hope, feel emboldened by the desire that people have felt across the course of the pandemic to be local and to support their locality and to be plugged into the locality. Definitely. And as you spoke about earlier, um, like the way racing has come out of Cheltenham and Aintree in such a positive light, I, I think that there is hope for for point to points. Um, it's it's access for local people, normal people who might have no interest g generally in racing or going to a big race meeting to, to come and experience it and get pretty like pretty close and like close to the action and uh bring the whole family you know it's it's a good day out and um i just hope that we get back to to that at some stage and as i said it's not necessarily the pandemic didn't cause this it was kind of coming anyway but i just think the pandemic situation mightn't have helped us for um, sure no for yeah. sure uh, can you you mentioned um going to the point to point with your grandparents when your dad would have had horses running were they involved in the game as well does it stretch back that far and even further yeah so my granddad started breeding horses um and he he owned them and put them in training with with other trainers back along and then when my dad and my uncle william got got older they were they were kind of probably breaking them and pre-training them to go away and then it just kind of evolved that William started riding them and Dad started training them. So that's kind of how it all started. It started with Granddad's breed. And then eventually they, they started getting a few horses to train from other people and it went from there. But um, yeah, that's how it started and still going. So your dad wasn't like, he he's a self-taught trainer. Yeah, definitely. He only, he, he just worked... Um, in one other yard for one other person, which is uh, David Gandalfo in England. Um, he, he worked there for, for a couple of months is all. And then right. he came and, yeah, trained away. That's pretty miraculous, isn't it? Yeah. I suppose it helped having William. William took to the, his brother William took to the riding and dad rode a bit, but says he wasn't very good. <laughs> Sure. That, um, it's a good combination so, to have where it's like uh, we, we've seen this horse from uh, before it was born to the bit where we broke it to you're going to ride it and I'm going to train it. Yeah, and I suppose it, it helped, um, you know, they they had a good relationship, I suppose, and that that's key as well for a trainer and rider to have a good relationship together. So I suppose it worked and it, it just went from there then. Yeah. I know, I know. I suppose, Max, as well, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the um, the Irish success at Cheltenham this year, 23 winners, which is quite, quite astonishing. But um, 
just in terms of you know people people look at the sport in this country and maybe sometimes they say the money that it gets from from government is isn't justified but just if you look at racing in your part of the world like it is absolutely um in the heritage of so many people i'm sure you've neighbors that have horses and you know um cousins that have horses and it's just i guess the your your upbringing and that of your dad isn't unusual for for the area around kind of mallow and and where, where steeplechasing itself more or less began in that that region Definitely. Um, there's a huge like interest in racing as well around here. We get a lot of um, kids from, you know, 13 to 16 year olds from uh, from Mallow um, that are just going to riding school in Mallow and they just call us and say like they want to be a jockey and can, can they start and uh, they, they would have never ridden a racehorse before or whatever and they come on Saturdays and they get a bit of experience and it's it's brilliant to see them. And it's brilliant to see the interest um, of of them, and uh, yeah, it's just it's it's huge industry. There's an awful lot of people employed, and as you said, the broader spectrum. If it's even breeding horses, pin hooking horses, training horses, whatever it is, it's it's a huge industry, and um, yeah, we need all. I think it needs all the support it gets. Your name will be familiar to people as an amateur jockey, and that's how we've we've titled you today. But obviously, the rest of your your day job and the rest of your life is involved in horses too, is it? Yeah, so I'm at home with dad all the time, um, just working on the yard with dad. That's my job, I suppose. I'm just lucky to be riding as well. Do you, but, um, do you want yeah, to do you I want like, to get into training? Like at some point in the future, is that part of your future? Have you? Have you thought specifically like when when being an amateur jockey finishes and, and obviously it's a brilliant competitive outlet uh, and you're clearly brilliant at it. When when that part of your involvement in racing is over, have you thought about what's next? Well, I, I like working with that at the minute. Um, I wouldn't like now to to say I would go training. I, I love horses. I love working with horses. To be honest, I could see myself doing anything with horses. Um, the people side of it wouldn't appeal to me as much, I suppose. Um, I'm better with the heart. I like working with them. And uh, at the minute, I really enjoy working with dad and stuff. So uh, I'll, see, I'll see what happens down the road. I'm not too sure yet at the minute, but uh, at the minute, I enjoy doing what we're doing. Yeah, it's um, like is when you say that it's interesting about the people, What? why do you say that? Is it just trying to deal with the owners and, you know, obviously the, the highs and lows of it? Yeah, I suppose I don't mean people as such, but I would. I'm. I just enjoy. I enjoy working with the horses, looking after the horses. I am notoriously not great for answering my phone or like just dealing with things. And uh, at the minute, I'm probably not the best person to become a trainer because that's what you have to do. So um, yeah, it's it's different, I suppose. Dad is very good at that side, and. Uh, I prefer the horse side, but maybe it'll come in time. Maybe that's a good combination for now as well. Let's talk a little bit about um, about Cheltenham, obviously, in 2020 and uh, the Fox Hunter Chase. This is one of those, obviously, it's a, it's a career moment where you win a massive race at, at Cheltenham. Uh, what do you remember about the day and the build-up and, and how much confidence did you have that you were going to be in the shake-up, let alone win the race? Yeah, I was... Uh confident enough going that he would run very well i thought he was underrated because he had a couple of poor runs but i knew i knew he had the ability to do it if he if he showed up on the day which he did and i kind of knew my fate fairly fairly early through the race he's the type of horse that you kind of know you you know how if he's going or not but it's not until you not until during the race you know so down the back um he, he lit up and was jumping really well and, and I was fairly confident then that he'd stay going and, and come up the hill so it was great it all just clicked on the day I suppose um, I was very nervous that morning like I was very nervous on the morning I don't, I don't know why I chilled them obviously um, I was extremely nervous but uh, confident but nervous and then uh, yeah it just all went so well like the race couldn't have gone any better for me were you nervous yeah. because he had a chance? Is that is that does it follow that you automatically thought that he had a chance and that your nerves are part of that? Like, do you get nervous before a race where you're thinking, look, this guy hasn't got much of a chance? I think it was. I think I just wanted to do. I wanted to do the horse justice. I want. I knew he could do it. I just wanted to make sure I got it right. 
And I suppose nervous is a funny word. I use it sometimes, but it's more like you're nervous before you go out for a football match. But like, it doesn't mean you're scared. It's it's that feeling. It's good. You need it, isn't it? It's like ap- apprehension maybe or something. It's what you need to operate. Like, um, But I felt an awful lot of that. And uh, I had to walk the track. I walked the track early on with Carl Llewellyn. We had to walk the track with him if you hadn't ridden around Cheltenham so many number of times. So that was great. He was he was great help. And um, did that early in the morning, about 10 o'clock. And I just had to go off and walk it again, like near the race, because I just, I was like hen and egg. I just couldn't settle. So I had to go off the track just to do something again. But um, yeah, it was great. And like I said, it all, it all just went. I had imagined the race in my head like so many times throughout the year. And it like just went exactly how I imagined it, it would. It came to pass. Just, yeah, yeah. It just, uh, it just how I imagined everything would happen happened. So it was great. What was the Cheltenham Bowls like? It was brilliant. It was, it was unreal. Like I just, you'd love to do it again, obviously. Um, but it was, it was unfortunate that our. Like, I'm just great, so glad it happened, but I was disappointed that some more of our family couldn't be there because it's it was very special to all of all of our family. Like my mom was at home, like all our our family, a lot of them would have come. But um, when the COVID was just kicking in, obviously that the week or two previous, no nobody made the trip. So, but uh, it was great to get home to them all after. Yeah. Pretty incredible photograph of. Uh your dad and you as a baby and then your dad and, and you as a grown up we've got them here side by side um, and yeah. so, and it's the same cup obviously so the difference is it 29 years in the difference uh 20 1991 yeah 29 years yeah and uh, you're a babe in arms so what was the story with the horse in in 91 yeah lovely citizen um yeah i think granddad bred him and um uh, granddad owned him william my uncle rode him and uh, trained them. So that was really real family thing. And uh, they had a great kick out of that. I think they I think they celebrated for like the whole year. So um, dad was very disappointed that, that our year that he, he didn't get to do half the celebrations. Um, they had a lot to live up to. But um, that was great for them. They, they really enjoyed that. I think the whole the whole parish, the whole I'd say the whole of Mallow was there that year. And um, yeah, they, they had a great time. Yeah, your um, your dad just sees a slight bit more of a grimace holding you all these years <laughs> later than in the initial photo. Yeah, but yeah. it's yeah. just that that father daughter thing though. Like it, it must be. I know obviously Patrick and Willie Mullins experience it every other day, but that that must be amazing when you come into the parade ring and you see you know the person uh, who you know essentially brought you into the world and raised you, and then um, you know to to have that kind of moment afterwards. Yeah, I was I was so happy as well for Dad, like because I know he's a long time trying to win that race. Um, like as I've said, we have mainly point pointers, so our main chance of a of a winner at Cheltenham will always be the Fox Hunters, and he has been there with many runners since 1991, and um, with no luck. So to to win it again, and I suppose for me to be riding it for him was very special. So I was delighted for that as well. It was, it was great, like, yeah, it was really good. Maxine, we, we, we kind of, I was constantly obsessed on this show about uh, jockeys' decisions to go pro or not go pro and the difference between being an amateur and the benefits of being an amateur versus going pro. At any point in your career as a rider, did you think, actually, I wouldn't mind seeing what life is like as a professional jockey? Uh, no, all riding now for probably 10, 12 years, I didn't. Um, I am passionate about point to points. I love be, I love point to pointing. Number one, and um, I am very lucky that I can still ride in. There's a, so many ladies races. I can ride in all those ladies races, bumpers, um, twenty one rides on the track, and then any any horse that Dad owns himself, I can ride on the track as well, and that doesn't count in my twenty one rides. So I'm in a very lucky position that way. But um, I suppose when the when this year Cheltenham came up about professionals being only allowed ride in the fox hunters, it did occur to me that I might would I, would, you know the thought came to my head would I do it, and I decided not to. But since the thought came to my head, then I 
I let myself explore the thought and uh, something that I might do sometime before I fi- before I finish writing, um, just to do it. And uh, but at the minute, no, I'm enjoying the point pointing. I, I want to go back point pointing when it when it comes back and stuff. But it, it's something that I might do at some point. Yeah. That's interesting. That's really interesting. Like, what what would the decision making process be? What would the point where you're the tipping point you reach where you go right? I'm going to try this now for a while, a year, 18 months, two years, see how it goes. Yeah, I suppose I had a lot of things I wanted to achieve in the point to point um, spear, which were like the ladies title every year. I tried to win that and that's grand. I've won a couple of them. And then I kind of set landmarks for myself that I that I would like to do. But I'm finding that they're very hard to achieve now because we have lost so many we've lost a, a lot of time we lost all last season and now all well, the second half and then this season and um time is pushing on and i i don't know are the the goals i set to achieve are they achievable maybe and uh i still have a bit more i'd like to do in point pointing but um i think i might just try the race, try the professional thing for a while at some stage. Um, no, maybe maybe when the time comes, I won't, but it's something that I think I might try. What weight are you? Uh, about 9'7". So, yeah. So that I'm like a, as, 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 a, as a lightweight rider, you obviously have potential then for, you know, you can easily see you'd be popular in some of the big handicaps as well. Maybe. Um, yeah, I just, um, I suppose... My my cousin Michael is uh, riding in point amateur now as well, and mm. Al, his brother has just started. And I suppose at home there's only going to be enough. Like someone has to push on, <laughs> someone has to move out. You know, there's only enough find the binders for so many. And uh, maybe the time will come that the two boys, um, like it's their time, and and I might move on. We've we've plenty of runners on the track as well. Um, that maybe I could ride and, and that, but um, we'll see see how it goes. Yeah. I, I, I think, in fairness, like I, I was blown away by the amount of coverage that was given to Rachel Blackmore, even in, in a global sense. Um, firstly, Cheltenham and obviously then Aintree, but there is no doubt whatsoever that Rachel Blackmore's success will be somewhere in your mind if you did make that decision. Yeah, um, I wouldn't be doing it to to to, pro- to, to break any records or or... or start again i am i am what i am at this stage um but it's just something that i i enjoy i enjoy riding and um like i said if the boys at home were coming on and there was three of us at home point to pointing um it just it just might be an option for me to to move on when i'm lighter and uh it's something i could do and just something to do, to just something to say I did and have a go at it and do the best I can and see how it goes. Just a different path. Yeah, totally. Can I ask you about what it, what concerns there would be? Like, so when you're weighing this up, you're like, okay, I, I can completely see the, the opportunity that the family reasons are kind of, it's a gentle push along and it seems like it's a gentle push along in the direction you want to go anyway. What would your concerns be about turning pro and the difficulties that you might face? Um, I suppose... I would have a lack of rides in, I get lovely rides in ladies races at the minute and they're great opportunities for us. Those ladies races are just fantastic to give, to give girls opportunities. Um, and I'm lucky that I've got some lovely rides and winners and great connections with people through them. You know, I might ride for someone in ladies race and I might get to keep the ride on it or whatever. It's a great connection to have. And uh, I suppose I wouldn't be qualified to ride in some of them. And uh, just again, with the horses at home and stuff, um, I don't know, I just, not sure. Mm. Well, Ger and I were debating this before we came on air, and I distinctly remember talking to Rachel Blackmore about this at the time when France brought in the allowance for female riders. Um, I think they actually subsequently changed the allowance because it, it was almost going too well. 
Um, now, there's an argument either way for it. I'm, I'm completely against it. I think it's just... I'm completely for it, but yeah. go on. Ger so Ger is wrong anyway, but he, it's, um, it's, I just think it's kind of saying, you, well, you're a female rider as such. You are basically inferior, which I just... No, it's not. Okay, Maxine, what's your take? <laughs> well, you framed it in a very uh, one-sided way. Well, there, okay, Johnny. okay. There's another. There's an entirely different viewpoint where you're thinking we need more female jockeys, and you need to incentivize owners to take what they might perceive wrongly as a risk. And one way to do that is to have a, a tiny little, a tiny little smidgen of an allowance to make sure that more people are incentivized to do it. It's it's simple uh, habit forming, economics, all those kind of arguments that you think, how, how are you going to break down structural anything, be it racism, be it poverty, whatever you need to do, you need to incentivize people to get on this path and they discover for themselves that actually the women are just as good as the men and away we go. But to get it started, it's not saying you're inferior, it's saying these people have an incorrect, they've come to, they've come to a judgment based on centuries of history and what we need to do is incentivise them to get over themselves, stop making stupid decisions, start making good decisions and give the Maxine O'Sullivan's of the world a couple of pounds. That's all. That's what I think. Well, before, before you come in there, Maxine... No, 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 come on, you, you've had your go. There article in the Times. I, I said about 10, 10 words there. You said about 110, 100, so I won't. 109 That's okay. of which I disagree with. Um, no, so the, the Times had a very good article. I forget the name of the, her, her name who, who wrote it. Um, I wasn't familiar with her as a journalist, but she had a very interesting article in the Sunday Times last week about... Essentially, she's done some research into this that in some respects, it's actually an advantage to be a female jockey um, over a male jockey in terms of psychology and also muscle mass and, some, and bone structure and a few things like this she went into. It wasn't exactly 100% um, convincing, but a lot of it, <laughs> it was certainly food for thought. Okay. Um, she spoke to people who were experts in their field in Britain um, who said that it's not surprising that female jockeys would do very well. Now, if you look at Holly Doyle, what the level she's reached, Rachel Blackmore, the level she's reached, and this is a sample of a very small number of, of female riders effectively who are basically punching above their weight. You don't need to be told, actually, you're a woman, you're inferior, here's five and pounds. That's not the and, message. And, and have, a go, have a good day for yourself and, you know, it'll give you a chance. Okay. What do you think, Maxie? Yeah, I, I don't think there's a need for a claim for ladies because I think when you start off, you get your claim anyway. You're exactly. You're man or woman. And then I think, you know... I think we've crossed the bridge, I feel, in racing where the ladies need a leg up. I think that the ladies have done done well enough and have proven that they can do it, that they don't need it, definitely in Ireland anyway. Um, I don't know what the situation in France would be at the minute. England, the same as Ireland. Um, I think we all start off with a £7 claim and that's a good young boy will will maybe lose that claim very quickly great he's going to be he's going to be very good then you know um a not so good boy won't lose that claim as quick like it's just the same as a girl it, it's the exact same i i feel i feel that we've crossed the bridge and i i don't think that we need that, that. that's the other point here that um they do male or female you start off with a claim so like it is in fairness like all female riders do start with a claim anyway but like if, if there's a debate about honeysuckle getting a mayor's allowance in the champion hurdle imagine rachel backmore taking five pounds off her back but you'd obviously ride it out over a period of time well you wouldn't have it forever well, well, you know, what a, there's no point in, that, that, like, it's already there as an apprentice but like, so how are you going to bring in let, another another allowance e easily easily i mean a little bit of sophistication how did the french do it um, the, can I can I ask you a question, Johnny? Who are the number two and three professional on the list? If you take Rachel Blackmore out, who who's second and third in the list of um, professional female jockeys in Ireland at the moment? It's probably like Sarah Cavanagh and Emma Toomey. And how many wins do they have? A couple, maybe. See, that's the difference. Um, like, like the numbers coming through aren't at a level yet where they need to be. And if you can incentivise that, what's the problem with that? You've just incentivised it. Her name is Rachel Blackmore. But but like Rachel Blackmore is a complete outlier. She's an outlier, but she's uh, she's going to be an inspiration for young female riders. And another issue is that weights are you know people are getting bigger, people are getting taller, and um, so young female jockeys will have an advantage. And that a lot of young f male jockeys just won't be able to do weights and they won't ride. And and that's definitely going to happen. Where you know you see the situation in the states where they don't have any American riders; they're all Latin American. Um, you know, Americans essentially are 
by and large too big to actually be jockeys and that's going to be a problem over here as well but I think what Rachel did was show that horses run for her because she's very good and I know this this is pretty much a sexist thing to say but I do think a lot of female uh, riders are actually more suited to, to particular horses than male riders because they generally have kinder hands and horses run for them. Yeah, I also think that like Rachel Blackmore, people forget started out with a seven pound claim for a long time. Exactly, like, yeah. It was point to pointing. Rachel was riding in ladies' hurdles, bumpers. Rachel like put in an awful lot of hard, hard work and dedication to get to where she is. Whether she's a man or a woman, like you know, a, a, a man could have done the, could have started out the exact same as as Rachel and given up along the way. Like mightn't have turned professional like she did. You, you know, Rachel like any Rachel worked really hard to get to where she is. Like um, and is very dedicated and mentally strong. And uh, I just think that she did it like without any help. Like I think it's there for other people. I I think. The amount, if you put the ratio of women that are trying to, be, that want to be jockeys, or men that want to be jockeys, and the amount of women that succeed and the amount of men that succeed, there just, there wasn't the women coming into it mm. wanting to be Rachel Blackmore, as there was the men coming into it that wanted to be Davy Russell. I think, so, yeah, I, I, yeah. Look, I, I agree with that. I wonder what the structural problem that caused that, like, lack of desire on the part of one part of the population versus the other because it's not that women don't enjoy being around horses or riding horses and I I think these are structural issues that go back and that to chisel out and to overcome them any incentive that you can do along the way is worth having a conversation about um, Maxine I do want to ask you though about the, the dividend that you think is coming from that because um, you know as we talked about it was a pretty dark time for racing essentially over the last year and then the Gordon Elliott story breaks before Cheltenham, Cheltenham happens and obviously it goes great for uh, Henry de Bromhead and for Rachel and then again at the Grand National. I, I, is there something that you see, like is there something tangible that you can see quickly from even those kids who are ringing you up saying they want to come out on Saturdays already? Is there a dividend from Rachel Blackmore being on the front pages? Definitely, yeah. Um, I, I do notice a lot, a lot more girls as well um, in, interested in racing, um, even just before, this is before Cheltenham even, um, a, a lot of girls we would get um, wanting to be, as they, they they say, they want to be a jockey, like, which is great, like, it's it's brilliant, there's a huge amount of them around here, and um, I just feel that it's, the, obviously we have race, which is un, an unbelievable institution for for the kids to go to to be technically to be jockeys. But um, I don't know, have we enough in the country for them to prepare them to go to yards uh, for work experience or to, to be jockeys, let's say. So some kids we would get would be 15, 16 years of age and they've never, ever experienced a racing yard. And... Uh, we are lucky that we can we help them and we've we've horses that they can ride we've older point pointers or we've a couple of retired horses that they can ride out but if they went into a big yard they'd get completely lost and i think they'd lose heart and they would they'd leave they they wouldn't you know the big yards don't have time to be to be teaching these kids how to ride race horses so um i think there there could be something set up to help that age group get a bit more involved in racing without having to go to race. Before they're even ready to go, like almost like a a, a schooling school a for the horse before they're ready to go to the training. In can get into race every year and it's fantastic. It's, it's unbelievable. But what about all those kids that don't get in? And maybe there's kids that want to finish school, but like just want to get experience. Like, I don't know, maybe like a pony camp, a racing pony camp or something. I don't know. But we, there's, I think there's more that we could do to help kids learn the basics of racing before they're thrown in to a deep end to go to some yard for the summer where they haven't a clue what a what a fork, what a pitchfork is, or what a, <laughs> mm. what a, a racing pad looks like. Yeah. Or, you know, um, none of us, none of us ever think a pitchfork is actually related to what we're going to end up being. But uh, it turns out learning how to wheel one is an important. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah. Uh, Maxine, good stuff. Uh, so at five o'clock, sorry, I've completely forgotten the name of your horse running at five o'clock. Harmonization. Harmonization. All right. Well, listen, we wish you the very best of luck with that and continued success, whatever comes next. And uh, look, we'll be keeping a very close eye in, on your decision to turn pro or not. But great to have you with us. And thanks a million for the insights. Thanks, Maxine. Very much. Bye. A reminder, of course, uh, Friday Night Racing is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. That was Maxine O'Sullivan there for our radio listeners. Are we going to achieve harmonisation among ourselves? Not a chance. No. Your your argument is basically an argument that uh, golf disproved when Tiger Woods romped home and won the Masters. Like, oh, this is going to solve all the racial inequalities in golf because look, we have this one person who has That's emerged not my from nowhere. At all. I, I, have, I said this long before Rachel Blackmore I said this long before. I wrote about this when the French thing came up. That's two or three years ago. My my view hasn't changed because of Rachel Blackmore. But you said that Rachel Blackmore was the answer. No, I said she's a what is she like? She's an inspiration in terms of um, I don't know something groundbreaking. Inse- she's in- incentivizing all the owners to give the opportunities in no, those fifty fifty calls. She, I, I she's already incentivizing Maxine to potentially turn pro. Like, what more do you want? But it's more so the young the young female riders coming up. I think w- that will be inspired by her and also Jer young girls who are playing sport generally will be inspired by by Rachel. And I think it does need to be seen in the wider context of women's sports in something of a revolution anyway at the moment. I mean, brought this up with uh, Joe Malloy on, on, on the papers round up last Sunday. You know, there was massive coverage in the Sunday Indo of um, Ireland and France in the in the Six, six Nations in the, the women's game. Um, and nothing was made of that, um, despite the fact that that would have been unthinkable a few years ago. And, race, and racing has been way ahead of other sports in terms of equality anyway. So I don't think we need to give female riders an allowance, which they already have when they start off anyway, like their male counterparts. Well, I've got the same one. Yeah, but until you get 50-50, you should be incentivising it to get to 50-50. It just needs to be 50 50 though but it, why not why not um, all of like the rest of life is why why shouldn't it be what um, like, what's wrong with that aspiration like i i don't know like there are you you mentioned you know sarah and emma and there are very you know there are very very few female riders over jumps i think we we the figures are very very poor i have to say i'm not necessarily saying we need 50 50 we need a lot more female riders but there are an awful lot of males struggling as well ireland is really competitive and that, that's more of an issue like if i if I had a son or daughter who wanted to become a jockey, it wouldn't. The gender wouldn't really be relevant at all. It'd be more like, well, A is the but danger. But you have to acknowledge that it is harder for women to get involved in in big time professional sport because of uh, generations of structural misogyny in Ireland. Like it is. It just is. It doesn't really exist to that extent in racing. But it, if not it didn't, not then compared the to other sports. Be much, the figures well, would be much more. Well, and that's all I'm saying is I just don't think that you can reach this one point at the end and say, okay, it's fixed now. It's let's not go. fixed. No, it's not fixed. I mean, I know like, as... there are four professional female riders over jumps in Ireland. Rachel was the first. And that aforementioned TG Cahar documentary, or sorry, race show that I, I mentioned earlier on from. Jump Girls. Tremor. Well, I think. Th- what they showed last Sunday was they, sh- they they spoke to her in 2016, I think. It was a five-year-old clip where she'd, um, you know, she hadn't her license long and, and she was justifying it at the time. And even then she was saying, I don't, I don't think the, the, the female thing is a big deal. And like, if you were to say to me back then, Rachel Blackmore would be almost champion jockey in Ireland, honestly, it would be one of the most ludicrous things ever. I mean, everyone... Everyone I spoke to at the time said, she's a journeyman amateur, what is she doing becoming a pro? And she got there through talent and determination. And no one's, and, no one's disputing that at all. I actually think it's harder for, for it, her. Her journey is all the more remarkable because of the barriers that get er, erected. And they get erected by, by uh, old school thinking from owners. And obviously there were a few owners along the way who, who broke out of that paradigm. And I'm just saying that I think that anything you can do to incentivise, to, to grease the wheels a little bit, to well, get us to a more equal society, I'm in favour the, la- the, la- the last thing I would say about that is there are, there are going to be owners who will say, I don't want that girl on that horse. You know, she's not going to be yeah. strong enough. But try to say that in the yard where basically there's a 50-50 chance whatever stable staff member you're talking to is going to be a woman and see, see how, how far you get because it, sexism in racing, I think it's something we should be really, really proud of. It really doesn't exist in the context it does in other sports. What? I know that from visiting yards. I know from talking to trainers and owners. If if you wanted I mean, to, you uh, to bet, if you like, wanted to have a bet though to get out in the last race, you were really hoping Nina Carberry was riding. What's the story of Brady Frost in the UK that has yet to come out properly? Let's let's wait and see. I think sure that, I think that has. Well, let's not speculate, Johnny, for yeah, legal reasons. But you know, I think that has a lot more to do with Bryony's personality and just how positive she is, and it grating with people than the fact that she's a woman. That's my that's my. Um, 
I mean, take on it. Okay, well, let's wait and see exactly where that story goes. And she's goes. a fantastic writer, by the way. And, like, it shouldn't be understated um, the joy that she's brought to racing in Britain. I know the British press absolutely lap it up when she does well, but her big race successes um, preceded Rachel's in terms of giving ra racing a very good image and putting smiles on people's faces, ultimately, men and women, on a Saturday. Right, let's talk about um, where we are in our 10 to follow. It's getting close. It's squeaky bum time, obviously, because we, we haven't even talked about this yet. There's only eight or nine days left of the uh, entire jump season. The tote tend to follow jumps champion is soon to be crowned as the competition wraps up next week. Johnny has a minor lead with 505 points. I'm nipping at his heels on 491.18 points. Who knows, those 0 0.18 points could be the difference between victory and a uh, lifetime of humiliation for the racing journalists amongst us. Uh, yeah, couldn't have put it better myself for once I agree with you. The competition is set to start again with the Tote 10 to follow for the flat season, which opens for entries this Saturday morning on totes.ie. We're going to have our own selections in by next Friday. You can enter the free-to-play game or the paid game for just €5.50. And last year, the winner of the paid game netted over €64,000. And there are prizes for the top 500 finishers. You have until Sunday, the 1st of May, to enter your 10 to follow flat selections. Find out more and uh, enter by visiting tote.ie. Uh, Punch of Sound is upon us. There's um, some, I saw somebody tweeting during the week. Is there a possibility that there's going to be more English winners at Punch of Sound than there were at Cheltenham? That's uh, it's probably not the daftest thing to say. There are some Clandes Obos coming over, some good horses. Um, you know, Bows are playing Shamrock Rovers tonight in the League of Ireland context. It's like, God, this, I mean, you wouldn't know it's on even from, even in the League of Ireland community. And Punch of Sound does have a low key um, kind of build up because obviously we're still without owners um, and people going racing, but um, some fantastic races. Only Suckle Abracadabras is going to be one of them, potentially on Wattelen and Monkfish. Um, obviously, Manella Indo coming back. Um, it's going to be a great festival, but like Punchestown is is a, is really a people's meeting. You know, they they kind of turn the Saturday into like a family day, which might itself sound gimmicky, but as far as I know, the Saturday has become Punchestown's most popular day. And from people who are from the area, you know, people just go to Punchestown. It's a thing that they do. They go racing in Punchestown to meet people. The racing is great, but it's obviously a bit of an aside. And you know, if James Connolly said Ireland without the Irish meant nothing to him, Punchestown without people will mean nothing to a lot of people but at least the racing is going ahead and I just implore um, you know the government to, to potentially look at letting at least owners come back racing because I think owners have had a really tough time but they've had to pay the bills without any of the real rewards uh, apart from you know getting a, a check for the for the prize money if they were lucky enough to have it. All right good stuff Johnny Friday Night Racing and Off the Ball is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. We'll see you next week. Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie.